Okay, well, I'm going to get started, everybody. We still have two of our speakers that aren't on yet, but um, hopefully I see them when they chime in here. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, we are on kind of a tight schedule since there's a lot of stuff to talk about. So everybody can hear me right. Just wave your hands. Okay, okay good. Hey, look at that. It worked. <laughs> I do have everyone on mute right now just uh, so there's less background noise and such. But again, welcome everybody to the Glendora Chambers 2020 Ballot Measure Virtual Town Hall. Uh, my name is Joe. I'm the president and CEO of the Glendora Chamber of Commerce, and I welcome you here tonight to learn more about the 2020 ballot measures you will be voting on in November. This will be by far the best and most exciting meeting you've had in at least 20 minutes, so I promise you that. Um, so we got to make it funny, right? We're talking about ballot measures. <laughs> but some are, they're not very funny, some, so. But, um, Again, I'd like to thank all of our presenters that you're gonna hear from tonight. I will be doing a few of, of these and they will be calling on some of our, our presenters as we go through them. Also, I'd like to thank, uh, uh, thank Dr. Cliff Hamlow, our chair of our Legislative Action and Economic Development Committee um, and the committee for all their expertise and participation in this very important committee that we have here at the chamber. I know it's a biased opinion, but I think it's a very, good, very experienced and knowledgeable committee throughout the, the, uh, the Valley here. So I thank everybody for their participation. Uh, we've got a couple of our presenters coming in. Great. Um, some housekeeping uh, to our, our presenters. Please feel free to use the chat feature if you want to share additional in, in, um, information, if, if you wish. And also the participants, if you have any questions or you want to you know, put those in the chat, and possibly as the presenters speak, they can go through those, um, or at the end, we can open it up for a question and answer. Uh, we will be going over all 12 ballot measures, a possible county charter amendment, and a general ob obligation bond. So I will be doing a few, and, our, and I will call on our, our presenters. You can unmute your, yourself. If you're gonna share your screen, please do so at that time, and uh, so, this is being recorded and streamed on our Facebook page, so we'll be sharing it af afterwards. So if people that weren't able to be on, they'll be able to view it later. So if everyone's ready, here we go. I'm gonna do the first one. Now they are gonna be kind of out of order. We're not gonna go 14, 15, 16, 17. We're gonna go out of order just so, um, it's just the way I did it. So, <laughs> uh, so it kind of you know, mix things up a bit. But I am gonna start with um, Prop 14. This is the Stem Cell Research Institute Bond Initiative. Um, a yes vote for this proposition would support issuing a $5.5 billion general obligation bonds for the state's Stem Cell Research Institute and making changes to the Institute's governance structure and programs. A no vote on this would not allow that. Um, and basically uh, from explanation of a stem cell research would be stopped because um, back in 2004, uh, Proposition 71 was voted on and passed, um, uh, allowing uh, $3 billion bonds to start the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine to do all this stem cell research that the California has been, been doing and allowing it since then. This obligation bond will basically just refill that pot of money to let that research keep going. It also dedicates $1.5 billion to research therapy for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, strokes, and epilepsy. Um, it does appropriate funds to, out of the general fund to be paid for the debt service which will be roughly $260 million per year over roughly the next 30 years. So basically, if you vote yes on, on this, it's allowing the issuance of those bonds to continue that research. A vote no would not, and, but it basically, um, the pot of money from Prop 71 is about done. So yes vote, no vote, it's up to you, okay? Um, so that's Prop 14. We're going to go to Prop 19, and Mr. Ryan Audison will be speaking on that one. Take it away. 
Joe, appreciate it. So Prop 19 is property taxes. That usually gets a little emotional with people. So I try to just say, hey, if we're looking at this, generally I give everyone the benefit of the doubt. Who are we trying to help with a vote yes on Prop 19? Um, so it Prop 19, uh, it helps eligible homeowners. So I asked myself, who is an eligible homeowner? It is a senior, uh, a severely disabled personnel, including our veterans, or victims of wildfires and natural disasters. So, okay, great. We want to help these people. What do we want to do? Uh, well, let's go back. Who else does it help? It helps the people who want the money, right? Because they're getting taxes, so they want some money. So that's who else it helps. Um, they want to create a new uh, state-ran agency called the California Fire Responsible Fund with the taxes that are generated out of it. So that is who else it would help. Well, how are we going to help people with a yes vote? Um, the yes vote is we're primarily talking about, again, severely disabled seniors, uh, disabled veterans, and those victims of wildfires. It will allow them to transfer their property taxes, right? So when you have a property, you have to pay property taxes and it usually gets assessed upon the purchase of the home. Well, some of these homeowners have had them for quite a while and their property taxes are pretty low. So what Prop 19 is actually going to do is change uh, the, the reassessment of property upon, upon transfer or sale of the property. So that is a change to the existing Proposition 13. Currently under Proposition 13, um, any home, any parent or grandparent can transfer transfer any home up to any value, um, including up to an, an additional one million of either a business asset or business income, and they can transfer that to their child without reassessment. So what they're trying to do is say, hey, we want to tax, retax, uh, reassess, and retax these properties when they get transferred, and we also want to put a cap on that. So. A yes vote would try to help elderly people. There's some other caveats in there, which I think are fun. Uh, currently, um, the when it will, let me slow down. So if we we're gonna say yes, it helps senior, severely disabled, eligible homeowners, uh, they can transfer as well. There's a limit currently that they can only transfer one time and they can only stay within 10 counties. Uh, a yes vote on this would remove that and they would be able to transfer up to three times, keeping that tax base low, and it would be a statewide, they'd be able to move to any county in the state and keep that tax base. So if we're trying to help people, generally, when you are trying to help somebody, somebody feels like they're not being helped. Um, so who feels like they would not be getting helped by this? So a yes vote would potentially have the opportunity to hurt or not help the children, the grandchildren of the parents or grandparents who are leaving this, the heirs who are leaving their real estate to them. Well, how? Here's how it hurts them, right? If, if currently, if I'm left a property and I want to use that as a rental property or I want to use it as a vacation home, um, I can. And I'm still, I get that amazing tax benefit uh, that my grandparents and parents worked so hard for. Now, uh, what the yes vote will do is it'll take that away. So if you don't move into that home within one year and make it your primary residence, then they will reassess the property taxes on that as well. So that's how it would potentially hurt them. Again, the way it currently stands is that it's any valuation amount you can transfer the property with. Here, it would put a cap on that. And so if you decided to make this your primary residence, uh, they will only give you up to a million dollar valuation. Anything over that, then they'll reassess the balance and add that to your current property taxes. Okay. Well, what is a no vote? Does a no vote help anybody? Yes, <laughs> helps the people we just talked about, right? The heirs, they get to keep uh, the low tax base. They get to continue to use the real estate that they've inherited for rental property, secondary income, stuff like that. Uh, and so if a no vote helps, again, some people feel like they might be getting shortchanged uh, and that would be the people, the, the eligible homeowners who would then be able to transfer throughout the state um, instead of just the 10 counties. Now, interesting fun fact, the revenue uh, that would be generated, 75% uh, of revenue, ge gener revenue generated would go to the fire response fund. 15% would go to a county, um, county revenue protection fund, but that only adds up to 90% and I couldn't find where the other 10% was going. I looked half of a day, couldn't find it. Interesting fun fact. Um, out of the 75% of the fire, um, 
response fund, 20% of that will go directly to the forest service and then the rest of it gets reallocated out based upon different variations. So if we are curious to what that looks like. So yes, Proposition 19 is an adjustment to Proposition 13 on the way that taxes get uh, or properties get reassessed upon transfer of ownership from grandparents, parents to the heir, child or grandchild. That's it. Okay, thank you very much, Ryan. Appreciate that. Um, Okay, next up, I have the pleasure of talking about Proposition 18, uh, pr primary voting for 17-year-olds amendment. My 17-year-old daughter loves this one, <laughs> but she won't be 18 right now anyways. So um, what this is, is a constitutional amendment, if you vote yes, which would allow 17-year-old who will be 18 in the next general election, to vote in a primary election or special election. A no vote opposes that constitutional amendment, thereby continuing and prohibiting 17 year olds and where like it is now you have to vote, you have to be 18. So um, currently, like I just said, you have to be eight, 18 to vote period, primary, special election, general election. But with this, again, it's a constitutional amendment that let's say someone is 18 years of age during the general, they'll be them. So if there's the primary or special election prior to that, that 17 year old will be able to vote. That's basically it. Okay, pretty simple one. So I will move on. Okay, now we have Prop 15. Prop 15, we're gonna actually have speakers for the yes side and then a speaker for the no side. Let me let someone in here. Uh, first, we're gonna start on the yes side, which we have Sergio Martinez and or Ben Grief. I know you have two of you that will probably speak on that. So if you wanna go, go ahead, the floor is yours. And good evening, everybody. I hope you're all doing well. This is Sergio Martinez and I'm a first grade teacher. I'm going to have Ben Grief uh, start us off, my colleague, Ben. Great, excellent. Thank, thank you so much, Sergio. And, and thank you everyone else for being here tonight and um, for, for having this forum. Um, my name is Ben Grief. I am on the executive committee of the Prop 15 campaign. And I wanna just you know, talk about really how common sense this initiative really is. Um, all Prop 13, or Prop 15, excuse me, seeks to do is to put California on par with how the rest of the country taxes large commercial properties. That's it. We want to do what Texas does, what Oklahoma does, what Alabama does, what Mississippi does, where just everywhere else in the country does. That's all. Uh, we certainly are not going to raise the tax rate at all. Um, California has a 1% tax rate on residential and commercial property. It will remain at 1%, uh, which is one of the lowest in the country. Um, we are also going to be giving small businesses the largest tax cut in a generation by exempting the first half a million dollars from the personal business property tax. So this is something that, again, it, it's just common sense. You know, we are going to generate up to $12 billion a year back to our schools, and our counties, our cities, and our special districts. Um, roughly 60% of the funds will go to you know, cities, counties, and special districts. 40% will go to K through 14 education. So that's you know, K through 12 schools plus community colleges. Um, and you know, it's, it's at this time right now um, that we're facing unprecedented budget cuts. Um, we are looking at deficits at every level of government and so we really have to ask ourselves, you know, how are we going to get through this time? You know, how are we going to fund our schools? You know, how are we going to keep um, filling our potholes, right? How are we going to keep funding the local services that we need? You know, we certainly have a pandemic going on right now. How are we going to keep funding our public health services? Well, really, we could continue to increase taxes on individuals. We could continue to nickel and dime small business is you know homeowners um, or we could just do what they do everywhere else in the country right and i think that's really the choice that we have right now um, because we are going to be needing more revenue moving forward 
Um, and you know, a lot of folks are going to be saying, oh, this is just going to be bad for all business. This is not a uniform tax on all businesses or even all commercial property owners in California, right? Most commercial property owners are paying fair market value in property taxes now. It's only a small number of large commercial property owners that are still paying taxes based on what their property was valued at three or four decades ago. 92% of this revenue from this initiative is coming from just 10% of commercial property owners, right? That's all, right? So this idea that this is, oh, this is gonna cause businesses to flee, absolutely not. You know, it, it, is Disneyland gonna get up and move to Las Vegas because they have to pay fair market value property taxes? Certainly not, right? And then, you know, the other thing that our opposition talks about, oh, this is gonna increase the cost of goods and services. Again, most commercial properties are paying fair market value property taxes. Um, but even so, there's absolutely no correlation between property taxes being paid and the cost of goods and services. I certainly invite our opposition to sort of cite those examples of where the cost of milk at a Ralph's in one area that is paying um, property taxes based on 40 years ago assessed values is much lower than the cost of milk at a Ralph's um, where they're paying fair market value property taxes. The fact is those examples just don't exist. You know, we talk about Chevron. Um, Chevron owns oil fields, refineries, many of their own gas stations. If this is passing down to consumers and why is Chevron's gas not the cheapest gas in the state? Well, it's because there's absolutely no correlation between the price of gas and the property taxes being paid. So again, this is just a common sense solution to what we're facing right now. This was important before, um, but now it's even more important. And, you know, the last thing I want to touch on here is the fact that we're facing unprecedented wildfires. And Prop 15 provides $390 million a year directly to local fire districts, right? We need more firefighters. We need more first responders. This is a real threat. This is something that we need to address. And so we can either provide those things by taxing ourselves, by continuing to nickel and dime us the way we've done for the last 40 plus years. Or again, we could put our state on par with what they do in the rest of the country and have large commercial property owners, again, only ones that are valued at over $3 million, pay property taxes based on what the current market is. And you know, the, also, this is just leveling the playing field. Right now we have an anti-competitive situation, right? Where one commercial property owner can pay 20 times more than their competitor across the street. How is that fostering new business? How is that fostering entrepreneurship? It's just not. It's really the very definition of government regulation of the free market. So we want to just completely level the playing field, put ourselves on par with what they do in the rest of the country and provide ourselves with the desperately needed resources that we need to fund our schools, to fund our local governments, and to make sure we have the funding we need to combat this ever growing threat of wildfires. So I'll take a break here and thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Do you have anything you want to share, Sergio, or we're good? Yes, I, yes, I do. I, I was invited to, to speak to you today, uh, primarily because I'm a first grade teacher in Hacienda La Puente, and I've been elected to represent the, um, uh, the California Teachers Association as one of the board of directors that represents Glendora. And part of the reason why the California Teachers Association is in a coalition to help pass Proposition 15 and schools and communities first is because of the revenue that it would generate for our schools that the funding that has been lost to us that dwindled down since 1977. It would recapture and reclaim $12.8 billion that part of that money would come to public education to help restore counselors, nurses, smaller class sizes, librarians, services for, for, for health, and for seniors. In this time of pandemic, one of the other things that the money can be used for is the restoration of our schools, the remodernization. Right now, as you may have heard in the news, that we are having 
bitter arguments over going back face to face. And I'm not here to discuss that, that opinion because I can go with you on that. But I am after this. When, whenever we go back, part of what the problem is with the coronavirus is that it's airborne. And if we have filthy old ventilation and we're sending our employees, our teachers, students, um, um, aides into those situations, we're, put, we're still maintaining and keeping them at risk. So that is part of the reason that we are asking for a yes vote on this and your support because our schools need it. Here in Glendora, I did the math. It would mean annually $4,408,215 annually. The Glendora School District has a large special ed population that that encroaches upon their general ed budget. This would be in supplement to that. And they, Glendora is also, no disrespect, it's an older community, so you're in declining enrollment. You don't have students that are coming in that generate the money. That another day, that's something we have to deal with on how you properly fund education, and we wouldn't have to be here tonight. But be, by reclaiming the money that's been lost and restoring it, we can provide for these services that also, by the way, go towards our community colleges. So I thank you for tonight, and I'll be hanging around for any questions you might have. Thank you, Joe. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, there are some questions that are, gonna, are in the uh, chat that we'll go over, um, but thank you for that. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Tino Rossi, who's going to give the, the, the rebuttal to that, the no vote yeah. part of it. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Uh, Sergio, certainly know you're facing challenging times. Ben, it's good to see you again. And, and I'm not here to argue that, that schools don't need more money. That, that's not what I'm argue, here to argue with. I'm here to argue that Prop 15 is the wrong solution. And I'm here to argue it for exactly the same reasons as Ben and Sergio. It's the wrong time. Ben just painted a beautiful picture of $12 billion in guilt-free money that counties, cities, special districts, and school boards are going to line up to receive. Well, if that's the case, why did the League of California Cities, the California State Association of Counties, the California School Boards Association, and the California Special Districts Association all decline to endorse the initiative? Because it's not as simple as they're making it out to be. They say 10% of all businesses in the state will pay 92% of this revenue. It's not the case. Small businesses will pay the increase in property taxes that Prop 15 will bring if it passes. Here's why. A overwhelming majority of small businesses in the state of California rent the property they operate in. They may own their business, but they do not own the property. Under this initiative, and I'm gonna share my screen, this isn't from our campaign website, this is straight from the initiative on the Attorney General's website. For purposes of this subdivision, the term small business shall be defined under these three criteria. You'll see the last criteria is the business owns real property. Most of these businesses that rent have what's called a triple net lease. It means that when they sign their lease, when they agree to rent that facility, they're agreeing to take on increases in costs related to maintenance, insurance, and wait for it, property taxes. Now, Ben argues that if these small businesses or even large businesses see an increase in their property taxes, it won't result in higher costs of goods and services. You know, that's certainly not what I was taught when it comes to economics and businesses. If you increase an input cost and you don't increase the price you're charging for something, you have a negative correlation in your profit margin. For those folks here who own a business, I don't know we have much more margin to take out of our businesses. California is already one of the most expensive states to operate in. We have the highest person, one of the highest personal income tax rates. Many of our counties have the highest sales tax rates. All of these things are going to contribute to higher costs of goods and services. It's why the National Federation of Independent Business, the California Small Business Association, the California Chamber of Commerce, the Family Business Association, and more than 150 local business groups, including the Glendora Chamber of Commerce, are all opposed to Prop 15. If you take anything away from this initiative, it's that small businesses and consumers are going to pay the $12 billion that's being proposed to be generated. Now here's the catch. We can't just assume this $12 billion will appear. The California Assessors Association says this measure is impossible to implement. 
Ben references other states where mass reassessments do happen for both residential, commercial, and industrial. I'd point you to a, a, a new study that just came out, the Washington Post just wrote about this, where mass reassessments are extremely inequitable for communities of color. It's a bad system. Prop 13 is working. The other thing I'll add uh, in terms of what Prop 15's impact is on the state of California. He mentioned we're in the middle of a pandemic, no doubt. Our local communities, our teachers, uh, our elected officials are facing some critical choices on how they're going to raise revenue. Uh, this initiative doesn't help. Read the LAO, read the initiative. It's not even implemented until January 1st, 2022. So we're looking at two years until we start the first phase of reassessment. The Legislative Analyst Office, nonpartisan, unbiased opinion on what the initiative does says they probably won't start seeing money till 2023 and actually some parts of the measure allow it to delay implementation until 2025. We're talking about five years from now, folks, this new $12 billion is not gonna address the current pandemic that we're in and is not going to provide the revenue that it's promised for at least an additional five years. That's backed up by the CAA study, California Assessors Association. Remember, those are the folks that are gonna have to go out and for the first time, hire 900 new staff members for which there is no qualified labor pool and go out and reassess these properties. Ben says, and the proponents say that it's only properties valued at 3 million or more. Again, not true. The initiative very clearly states that if you own commercial and industrial property and your total ownings are an aggregate in excess of 3 million, then all of your properties are subject to reassessment under the initiative. Meaning if I own three commercial buildings, each worth $1.1 million, even though individually those properties aren't worth $3 million because the aggregate total of them is $3 million or more, all of those properties are subject to reassessment. Folks, we have no comprehension of who's going to be exposed under Prop 15. There are properties, there are counties that are going to have to communicate for folks who own property in different counties. So this idea that the proponents can clearly say that only 10% of properties are gonna pay 92% of the tax. There's no research or backup to where they would get that because these properties haven't been reassessed yet. There would be no baseline uh, for figuring that out. The other thing I'll point out is our communities are in need. We're not arguing that. Here's the sad part for more than 20 counties. And again, this is backed up by the Legislative Analyst Office and the California Assessors Association in an independent study. More than 20 rural counties are actually going to lose money under the initiative. Here's why. Under the initiative, small businesses who qualify, aka small businesses who own their property, are eligible for a $500,000 business per personal property tax. We're not arguing that. The problem is in some counties, they hand out more tax breaks than they generate in new revenue from reassessing commercial or industrial property. So in rural inland counties, if Proposition 15 passes, they are going to be a negative net loser. How is that a solution for the challenges they're facing at the local level? There are many more flaws, including agriculture. Agriculture is not exempt from this. Any indication to that is misleading and quite frankly false. California Farm Bureau Federation, Ag Council of California, Western Growers, League of Food Producers, every major ag organization in the state has come to the same conclusion. Real properties broken up into three sections, land, fixtures, and improvements. Ag land is exempt. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that a farmer's dirt or land is gonna be reassessed. Here's what is an improvement or a fixture. A winery, a, a dairy barn, a processing facility, an almond processing facility, even trees and grapevines are going to be subject to reassessment at fair market value every year. If you don't think farmers who are already pinched under the regulation are going to have to increase their costs to make up, I mean, we're talking generational families who have owned their properties and are protected under Prop 13 are gonna see massive rises in their property taxes. They'll have no choice but to increase the cost for consumers. All in all, Prop 15 is bad policy. It, less than 40% of the money goes to the schools. You know, I'm a public school, uh, you know, product. I went to public school for my K through 12. I went to Fresno State University. Less than 40% of this money goes to the school. The way that it's broken up, the first chunk goes to the state to backfill for any losses in personal income tax. Then you've got to go ahead and pay the assessors for going out and assessing it. Some say it's 700 million. The assessors think it's closer to a billion. 60% then goes to the counties and cities. And then you're left with like 35% of this money going to school. So we need to think about better solutions to the problems we're facing than just passing a massive tax in the middle of a pandemic 
on consumers and businesses who have been struggling for months. So we hope you continue to support our campaign. Uh, we're appreciative that both sides are being represented here, but we believe the best choice in November is to vote no. So with that, Joe, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions and turn it back over to you. Well, thank you very much. And I've been monitoring the chat questions and it looks like in both of your presentations, both um, most of them were answered. And then a couple of people have been answering them too. So, I mean, unless someone has any other uh, questions, we'll just, we'll move on. And then we're, our time is, is, is really good. So we will have time at the end to answer more questions if you think about it. So please feel free to use the, the chat. And, um, but we really wanted to give the argument on both sides for Prop 15. It, it's an important one on both sides. You know, so in, in this function, we, we, we wanted to give that um, opportunity. So thank you both, or all three of you, for your um, presentation. Sorry, I keep looking this way because all, all of you are over here. <laughs> so, okay, I'm gonna move on. Um, I'm gonna do Prop 23. This one's fun. Uh, Dialysis Clinic Requirements Initiative. Uh, this one you may, it may seem familiar to you. Um, a similar one was voted on and voted down actually Prop 8 in 2018. Uh, what this is, is a yes vote for this supports this, um, would support a ballot initiative to require chronic dialysis clinics to have an on-site physician while patients are being treated, report data on dialysis-related infections, um, obtain consent from the state health department before closing a clinic, and not discriminate against basis, patients based on their source of payment for care. A no vote opposes all of that. Now this, this one, um, I've you know, read the details. I mean, that's basically, I mean, that's what you're gonna see on your ballot. Um, there's, which at the end of this, or if you go to this address, that you can get your, your, your ballot, and there's pages and pages of this, this one that you can read about. But from what I saw, this measure keeps coming back and, and, the, and it's been voted down. Um, one thing this does is it, it, it would increase the state and local government costs likely into the tens of millions of dollars because of the, the reporting and the you know, added um, cost to the businesses and such. Um, this ballot measure is, is only supported by local, or not local, but medical unions. It's pushing, it's pushed for that. And things that, that I've read is that um, people are saying that the voters are being um, asked to play role of healthcare regulators with this one. Um, it's also trying to force I'm, I'm from re reading into it, um, local units have tried to unionize dialysis centers. And this is a way they're trying to, to do it. They've been unsuccessful. So they keep trying to put this, this one out to require, I know the definitions here and stuff don't say that, but you got to kind of read into it. There's a lot more inf inf information on it. So again, a yes vote supports the idea of having the additional medical staff on, on, on hand, reporting, um, and then asking before a clinic is to be closed, and then the uh, discrimination against patients based on their source of payment, meaning they're paying cash, insurance, you know, that, that kind of stuff. So um, I don't know if anybody has any questions on that one. I have someone coming in. I don't. Let's see that. Okay, we got Prop 15 stuff going still. So I'm going to leave um, Prop 23 at that. And at this time, I would like to introduce Mr. Gary Boyer. He's going to go over Prop 20. Hey, thank Good you, way. Joe. Um, Proposition 20 is known as the, the official name is a Criminal Sentencing, Parole, and DNA Collect Collection Initiative. Um, we know it better as the Keep California Safe initiative. This has actually been going on for a couple of years. It was tried to get on the ballot in 2018 and, and didn't make the deadline. So uh, it's coming up this November. Um, this ballot measure is designed to make changes to AB 109, which the legislature passed in 2011, Proposition 47, which we voters uh, passed 2014, 
And in Prop 57 in 2016, another proposition voted on by uh, the voters of California. And it basically does just four things. Prop 20 expands the list of violent crimes to include rape of an unconscious person, sex trafficking of a minor, assault on police officers, felony domestic violence, plus a, a no, number of others, but those crimes right now are no longer considered violent crimes. They were changed under Proposition 47. And by making them nonviolent crimes, that allows inmates uh, to be eligible for early release from prison. So Proposition 47 reduced uh, a, a number of violent crimes to nonviolent status. The second thing that Prop 20 does is it reduces the threshold of a dollar amount before a theft is considered a felony on your third offense. So right now, if somebody uh, commits a theft of less than $950, they can do it as many times as they'd like, and it is considered a misdemeanor, and they are issued a citation for it. And uh, I can tell you there are some criminals that have been issued as many as 80 citations that we have record of. What Prop 20 will do, it will make it so that you can steal $949 once and receive a citation. You can do it a second time and receive a citation. But on the third offense, it reduces that threshold to $250. So if on your third offense, you commit a theft and steal more than $250, it then can become a felony. You can be arrested and put in jail for it. Um, what happened in Prop 47, one of the other issues with Prop 47 is that it increased the limit of the uh, theft to go from a misdemeanor to a felony. It used to be $450 and Prop 47 increased that to 950. So that's the second thing Prop 20 will address. The third thing is it will allow a parole board to hear and take into consideration an inmate's entire criminal record when considering somebody for parole. AB 109 based someone's ability to be granted parole solely on the crime that they are in jail for. So if they committed a number of crimes and it was chosen to only um, take them to trial on one crime, that's the only crime that can be addressed at their parole hearing. So this will make that change. And then the other thing to, um, that happened in Prop 57, Proposition 57 changed many of the offenses that allows inmates to become eligible for early re release from prison. So typically if somebody gets convicted to a crime, they're required to at least serve half of their sentence well, Prop 57 reduced the number of crimes that, that fits into that category. And so this will adjust, um, address that issue as well. And then the fourth thing that Prop 20 does is it reinstates a collection of DNA for certain crimes, mostly the ones that I've talked about above that were reduced to misdemeanors from felonies under Prop 47. So that's pretty much what the initiative does. A yes vote supports the initiative and it um, adds the crimes to the list of violent crimes. It allows the parole boards to hear somebody's complete criminal record when trying to determine their, uh, whether they get released or not. And it uh, allows DNA collection on crimes that it currently doesn't. Uh, no vote simply leaves everything the way it is and it leaves uh, AB 109 Prop 47 and Prop 57 in place. The fiscal impact of this proposition, I'm just going to share what is on the official sites. So the first impact will be an increased cost of prisons, and the estimate is officially in the tens of millions of dollars. So they're estimating that the cost to run the prisons will be increased by tens of millions of dollars. It also estimates that our court costs will go up. And the estimate for that is actually several million dollars. And it also talks about an increase of law enforcement cost, which is likely to be more than a few million dollars. So those are the numbers that they used. Um, the people that support 
this bill. There's actually some bipartisan support in the assembly. There's a number of assembly members that, that support it. The Orange County Board of Supervisors, um, naturally a number of law enforcement uh, agencies and, and groups, and the California Grocers Association. Those who oppose the bill is Jerry Brown, the ACLU, and there weren't a lot that opposed it. So there was a Patty Quillen and Lynn Schusterman who are listed as philanthropists that oppose the bill. And then the interesting one is the California Partnership to End Domestic Violence also opposes the bill. So that's basically the summary of uh, Proposition 20. Uh, if anybody has any questions, we can address them at the end. Thanks, Joe. Great, thank you very much, sir. Okay. Uh, next up, we have Claudette Dane from Citrus College to discuss Measure Y. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, everyone, for allowing me the opportunity to present to you this evening. Uh, as Joe mentioned, my name is Claudette Dane, and I'm the Vice President of Finance and Administrative Services at Citrus College. I'd like to also take this quick opportunity to acknowledge my colleagues from Citrus College. On the call today, we also have our board president, Dr. Patricia Rasmussen, our superintendent president, Dr. Geraldine Perry, and our Citrus College Foundation director, Ms. Christina Garcia. But as part of my role at Citrus College, I oversee facilities, and I recently had the privilege of facilitating the college's comprehensive educational facilities master plan. And um, from that, I'd like to talk to you about Measure Y. Joe, do you mind if I share my screen and put up a presentation? Sure, sure, please, please do. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see that presentation. There you go. Okay, great, thank you. So Measure Y, Safer College Classrooms. Just some quick information about Citrus College. We are 100 years old, over 100 years old, founded in 1915. We are the oldest community college in Los Angeles County and the fifth oldest in California. We serve nearly 20,000 students annually, including veterans and seniors. And several of our college buildings were built in the 1950s and 60s, and they currently lack the infrastructure to support modern technology. A yes on why vote maintains local affordable education for our community with the cost of attending California public universities being more than six times that of community colleges, more local students and their families are relying on Citrus College for affordable education. And this is especially important at this time. Yes on Why saves local families thousands of dollars ensuring students can get college credits, certifications, and job skills at a reasonable price. Yes on Why will update classroom technology. Uh, several of our science and engineering labs at Citrus College were built in the 1960s. And as I mentioned, they lack the infrastructure needed to provide modern education in science, mathematics, technology, and engineering. Yes on Why would replace outdated electrical wiring, expand existing labs, and update instructional technology to ensure that our students are competitive for 21st century careers. Yes on why in our local economy, again, this is something critical during this time. Yes on why is part of a local and regional economic recovery plan. It creates local jobs and boosts the economy by expanding Citrus College's training partnerships with local employers such as NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory or JPL, Toyota, Metropolitan Water District, and the City of Hope Hospital and Research Center. Yes on Why retains and attracts well-qualified teachers, provides the technology and training facilities needed to prepare students for jobs, job skills in demand during the economic recovery continues to provide clean drinking water at college buildings, 
meets earthquake and fire safety standards and improves the quality of education at Citrus College. And of course, Measure Y is fiscally accountable and transparent. Measure Y, the Citrus College Career Education Repair and Affordable Higher Education measure is a $298 million general obligation bond measure. Yes on Y includes tough fiscal safeguards such as citizens oversight, public disclosure of all spending, and annual financial as well as performance audits. Of course, no money from Measure Y can be spent on administrator salaries or pensions, and all money from Measure Y will be spent for Citrus College and cannot be taken by the county, state, or the federal government. We are very happy to present our growing list of endorsers for Measure Y. As you can see, our list continues growing. This is as of the time that it was printed. Uh, of course, our Citrus College Community College District Board of Trustees, a former mayor of the city of Glendora, members of the Glendora Chamber of Commerce, numerous Glendora residents, members of the Zusa City Council, superintendent of the Zusa Unified School District, members of the Claremont Unified School District Board of Education, the superintendent of Claremont Unified School District, members of the Doherty Unified School District Board of Education, as well as the superintendent of Doherty Unified, members of the Charter Oak School District Board of Education, Monrovia City Treasurer, and the Vice President of Monrovia Arcadia and Doherty Town Council, as well as high school principals from Monrovia and Claremont High School and Monrovia residents. And again, the list keeps growing. Um, we are very pleased with the endorsements and lastly, our local students, thank you for supporting Yes on Measure Y. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, let's see. Does anybody have any questions? I know there was one, looks like Chris Garcia was answering it in the chat. Any other questions? Okay, well, if you think, think of something, we have a few, few more to go, go through. Um, we can answer them then. Or actually, there's one. What is the cost to each homeowner? Sure, I can go ahead and answer that right now. Okay. The average cost, based on the assessed valuation of our um, Citrus Community College District median house uh, assessed valuation, would come out to roughly $90 per year for the average homeowner. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay, well, if you do, we'll, we'll go back to it. Um, so we'll, we'll move on. Thank you very, very much for your presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, next up, I'm going to bring up uh, Dr. Cliff Hamlow, and he is going to talk about Prop 16. Okay, Prop 16 is a California constitutional amendment, and um, it's a uh, dealing with uh, discrimination or preferential treatment. The first issue on the particular uh, initiative says that the state shall not discriminate against or grant pre preferential treatment to any individual group on the basis of race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin in the operation of public employment, public education, or public contracting. That Proposition 16 will repeal that. And um, that came into being in 1996 with the passing of Proposition uh, 209. California became the, became the first state to enact such a ban. And uh, now it's uh, on discrimination. And now uh, this is an effort to uh, repeal that. One of the key, ter key terms of affirmative action is preferential treatment, which happens when an applica applicant, especially related to the college admissions uh, programs, is more likely to be selected than another applicant with similar or better qualifications due to other factors such as race, ethnicity, or gender. 
a common, common form of affirmative action in college admissions is racial preferences. And uh, 209 uh, or said that that can't be the case. However, if voters approve Prop 16, California public colleges and universities would once again be allowed to consider a student's race when making admissions decisions. Racial preferences would be allowed, but not strict racial quotas. So it's not a quota program or a race-based point system. The race, use of race would be allowed to uh, the extent that the US Supreme Court uh, cases have uh, come down and allowing. Supporters conclude that in the 21st century, the state of California needs to hire uh, more women to positions of leadership, contract with businesses that reflect the diversity of California, and expend, expand access to higher education for all Californians. Those that oppose it would say that if they, they would primarily cite that it's divisive, that it's uh, discriminatory and constitutionally questionable is what they would say. The nature of 16, as well as the positive results of 209, which they say that 209 was a positive step, has yielded uh, a good opportunity for underrepresented students in California public universities since it has been implemented. Opponents believe that Proposition 16 is not a true affirmative action program, but is aimed at legalizing discrimination and government sanctioned racial favoritism. So as you uh, vote on Proposition 16, uh, if you want to re uh, repeal the uh, what's in the Constitution now re that describes uh, discrimination, and replace it with um, uh, the opportunity for uh, institutions really to make decisions on their own within the parameters again of, of um, uh, court decisions, then uh, you would be a supporter of it. I think that pretty well sums it up. You either are saying we need to uh, change our Constitution related to, to discrimination, or we need to and, and allow uh, a greater opportunity for decision making by the institutions. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Ham Hamlo, for that. We we appreciate anybody have any questions on that one at all? No. Okay, if you think think of them, just put them in the chat or hold them, and when we get to the Q and A, we'll we'll go over those. Okay, I'm going to take the next next one. I'm going to go over Proposition 22, the app-based drivers as contractors and labor policies initiative. I'm sure we've all seen the the commercials going about every third commercial on TV about Prop 22. Uh, Prop 22, the yes vote would support this ballot initiative to define app-based transportation slash rideshare and delivery drivers as independent contractors and adapt labor and wage policies specific to app-based drivers and companies. A no vote opposes that, meaning California, California Assembly Bill 5, which I'll explain that one in a moment, could be used to decide whether app-based drivers are employees or independent contractors. So let me kind of go over AB5 first. For those that haven't heard about it, AB5, or also called the Dynamax test, it really rocked the world in 2019 for independent contractors. Um, this bill basically eliminated the independent contractor roles almost everywhere you looked. Um, but since then, I think once I checked at one point, there were 15 to 18 bills trying to pull different industries out because basically it made industries such as newspaper delivery, musicians, consultants, app-based drivers, and so on and so forth, 
employees when they did this three-part test that I'll also go over, um, which when that happened, if a business was used to independent contractors where they basically just 1099 at the end of the year, pay their fee, and that's it, made them employees, which when you add an employee to your business instead of an independent contractor, there's additional taxes, you know, payroll taxes, workers' comp, so on and so forth. So it's a lot more expensive to have an employee than an independent contractor. Um, what AB5 did, it established a three-factor test to decide how uh, decide a worker's status as an in independent contractor. Now the three-factor test required, one, the worker is free from the hiring company's control and direction in the performance of work, which basically means they can't tell them to do anything. Two, the worker is doing work that is outside the company's usual course of business. And the third test is the worker is engaged in an established trade, occupation, or business of the same nature as the work performed. So that's clear as mud, right? So basically that pretty much eliminated the majority of independent contractors, kind of rocked the, the world. You know, we got calls, emails, people, okay, you know, especially like, like musicians and news newspaper papers and such, as, as I mentioned. Um, so, and at the same time or during this, you know, how this proposition came into play, Uber drivers, Lyft, DoorDash, all these guys, the drivers assembled a, a group and they wanted benefits. They wanted some minimum pay, healthcare benefits, insurance, you know, because they saw other people doing, hey, we need a minimum too. So this proposition kind of came in as a compromise to try to fight so Uber and all, all these guys could keep the, the employees, or not employees, the independent contractors working for them because they say if this doesn't happen and they have to em employ them, I mean, there's been threats on the news and the, you know, Wall Street and stuff that they're, they would leave Cal Cal California because they said they wouldn't be able to afford it. Um, so, so basically, again, an a, a yes vote would allow the independent contractor with some employee benefits. A no vote would mean we'd, they'd have to apply the AB5 rule to see how the, um, the employees would, would be based. Now, this, this one, looking at some of the supporters and the people against this, the supporters of, of this, there's a lot of you know, different, you know, Cal Asian Chamber, California Chamber, California NAACP State Conference, um, the National Black Chamber of Commerce, California Hispanic Chamber, a lot of chambers, um, California Small Business Association, of course, DoorDash, Lyft, Uber, Instacart, Post, Post, Postmates, um, California Police Chiefs Association, California Peace Officers Association, and so on and so forth. The opposition is no on Prop 22. Um, and then um, Kamala Harris, Anthony Red, Red, Redden, State Assemblyman, Elizabeth Warren, um, and then let's see, California Labor Fe Federation, California Teachers Association, Unite Here, um, and so on and so forth. So um, now then looking at finances, for, for this, you, which I'll share, it's on this, there's a link here. Um, Lyft, Uber, DoorDash, all these guys, they put in a lot of money for this. <laughs> so, you know, to, to try and get this through. So, so again, unless there are um, questions, it looks like there's still Prop 15 questions. Um, but um, again, Prop 22, yes vote supports to keep the, um, drive drivers as in independent contractors, not making them employees, and um, a no no vote would we'd have to apply um, a something bill five to determine if they are independent contractor or 
employee. And just based on those three factors, they'd have to be an employee. <laughs> so um, anybody have any questions at all? No? Good. Okay. Well, I'm going to move on here. We're going to go to Ryan Audison to go over Prop 21. Thank you. All right, Joe, I appreciate it. Everyone who's presented so far, thank you. Love the uh, conversation on the side. Uh, Prop 21 is a bigger deal than it might just appear. Um, when you talk about the complete repealing of, of something that's been around since 1995, uh, we should talk about the Costa Costa Hawkins Rental Housing Act. Uh, this would completely repeal that. And so I think that if we're going to talk about a complete repealing of something and a replacement with something else, uh, it should probably be treated with a little bit more serious. And so I, I went with the who's at hurt, who's at help, and it literally, literally drew a line right down the middle and said it really actually pitted landlords and tenants, which is sort of unfortunate. Um, but the idea of Costa Hawkins, so let's talk about what that is first right so costa hawkins was done in 1995 and what it said was hey um uh landlords are allowed to increase rent prices to market rates when a tenant moves out uh and this ballot measure um would actually require local governments to adopt rent control to allow uh, a certain percentage of that so costa hawkins said in 1995 um, you cannot have rent control right there are certain cities that could do it but there were exemptions to what Costa Hawkins was. This will completely strip that away and instead it will replace it with a rent control that only exempts a small portion of period. So rent control would be, it would, let me phrase that, it would allow local governments to, so local cities, uh, counties to enact rent control. Uh, the only exemption would be if the property was owned by a natural person, so no corporations or anything like that. Um, and you could not have more than two units uh, per title. So what that is saying is if you're a mom and pop and you've over time acquired two or three single family residences to supplement your income and you've got some rental property, I've heard once or twice before that real estate is one of the best investments you can make. Uh, perhaps that might be changing. So if you're a mom and pop and you own two or three rental properties, now a local government can come in and say, sorry, we're going to cap the amount of money you can change for rent. That is what a yes vote is saying on this. Um, again, not only is it just the number of two properties, um, it is also that the properties have to be 15 years or newer. So uh, for 2020, the property was built in 2005, we're great, but in 2021, suddenly you're no longer exempt for that particular property. There could be a case made for raising uh, to helping lower uh, the amount of evictions. We don't, we don't want landlords raising rents. It's getting a housing crisis in Southern California. There's not enough inventory. Prices are high. Rents are high. And so they're saying, hey, we need to control that. If we go back to 2018 and all out statewide rent control, Proposition 10 was uh, put on the ballot and it, and it lost. It was defeated quite handedly. Um, and so then in 2019, we had what we call the rent cap and just cause eviction, which was passed. And so there is already, I'll say that again, um, there is already statewide rent control in place. So landlords are only allowed to raise their rent 5% plus CPI. And there's conversation around uh, what that CPI is, local area, or was it for the state CPI? And so there, the, that law in itself was ambiguous. So there is already statewide rent control in. What this does is then say, hey, if you want to, counties or cities, you want to crack down a tighter rent control, you can, only to the point uh, a landlord is only allowed, if a tenant moves out, creates a vacancy, under the way it is now, you can bring your rent up to market rate. If this passes, you will only be allowed to increase your rent 15% each time for the first three years. Uh, and so again, if, if we were gonna tie all of this together, I get inherited a house, I own two rental properties, I inherit the third one, I'm no longer as exempt. So now you've capped the amount of money I can charge and you've just reassessed my taxes. So now you're taking more money from me and limiting the amount of money I can make. Um, it's an interesting concept, but prop a vote yes on Prop 21 
uh, literally supports a ballot initiative to allow go uh, local governments to enact rent control on housing that was first occupied over 15 years ago with a small exemption for landlords. A no vote opposes the ballot uh, in continuing to prohibit rent control on housing that was first occupied in February 21. I thought since this was such a big, uh, a big deal, again, full repeal on limiting the amount of, I mean, this, this too, as Prop 15 is a, an emotionally charged conversation around how are we going to tax people that own property. Um, that's really all of that is. The emotion comes around with how are we going to spend the money and do we need to spend it. But there are a lot of propositions on the ballot that are talking about taxing property owners. So now we want to increase taxes, lower rents, uh, and is that okay? Uh, we don't know. That's what the voters get to decide. So if we're going to repeal Costa Hawkins, Costa Hawkins who is supporting that? Uh, Bernie Sanders, Maxine Waters, the California Democratic Party, Dolores Huerta, Michael Weinstein, uh, the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, SEIU, ACLU, Los Angeles Tenant Union, who is opposed to it. Um, one of the elected officials is Gavin Newsom is opposed to it. Uh, AMVETS, Department of California, is opposed to it. California Asian Pacific Chamber of Commerce. California Council for Affordable Housing is against it. California Seniors Advocate League is against it. Uh, Congress of California Seniors is against it. The American Legions, California Chamber of Commerce, and the NAACP is against it as well. So take a look at it. If you own rental property, this is a, uh, it's a big deal. And don't forget, uh, we have already have statewide rent control in place that slipped in last year. And I will be more than happy to take any questions now or at the end when Joe says so. Anybody have any questions? No? Okay, well, if you do, um, kind of hold them. We only have a couple left. And again, I'm doing the next one. So if you missed me from Talk Talk, and here I go again. Um, I'm going to be, uh, this one I'm going to talk about, um, so I'm trying to make this funny, right? You know, uh, Proposition 17. This isn't a funny one. This one, it's, it's, it's a serious, um, but it's, it's a decision the voters have to make. Uh, Prop 17 is voting rights restoration for persons on parole amendment. A yes vote on Prop 17 supports this constitutional amendment to allow people on parole for felony convictions to vote you know, while they're on parole. A no vote opposes this constitutional amendment, thereby continuing to prohibit people who are on parole for a felony conviction from vote voting. So right, right, right now, someone's on parole. They cannot get that voting um, privilege back until they finish their sentence and parole and everything. Um, I, I heard a great um, debate on, on this on the radio not, not that long ago, both the yes and the no. Um, the yes on this, their argument was, okay, someone did a crime, you know, and they were sent to a prison and they were let out on parole. And while they're on parole, they're trying to get back into society. They're possibly working, paying taxes, stuff like that. So why not give them back the privilege of voting while they're trying to pay the rest, pay their, for their crime or you know, finish their sentence you know, while they're in that process? So that was their argument for yes for this. The no side was, they stress that voting was a privilege for law-abiding citizens. That once the convictions were you know, done, the parole's done and everything, then they would gain back their privilege to vote. So that's basically it. You know, do you feel someone on parole that you know, has the right to get their voting privileges back before parole's done or not? Yes and no. Um, kind of some how California compares to other states. Uh, California is one of three states that requires a person convicted of felonies to complete their prison and parole sentence before we regain to, to, to vote. As of 2020, 19 states allowed people convicted of felonies but who were on parole to vote. 17 of these states did not allow people to vote while in prison. Two states, Maine and Vermont, allow people who are in prison to vote. 
the remaining 28 states had additional disqualifications compared to California. Um, people, con uh, you know, for people convicted of uh, felonies, 18 states disqualified pe people who were imprisoned on parole or on probation. Seven prohibited people convicted of certain felonies from ever retaining their rights to vote. In Iowa, conduct Kentucky, and Virginia, people convicted of felonies never regain their right to vote, although their governors can issue orders restoring those rights to the individual or group. So like usual, every state's a little bit different. <laughs> um, but this one is really just, what do you think? You know, someone on, 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 on parole, should they be able to vote or should it stay as is? And um, once that sentence is done, then they re regain that, um, that opportunity to vote. So that's Prop 17, if anybody has any questions. No? Okay. Well, I'm gonna hand it over, back over to Gary Boyer. He's gonna talk about the um, Los Angeles County budget allocation. Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, <clears throat> This is the, the, the name of this initiative is the Los Angeles County, California budget allocation for alternatives to incarceration charter amendment. So this is gonna be a charter amendment to um, the, the Los Angeles County charter. The, the LA County charter is sort of like the state constitution. And so this is an amendment to the Los Angeles County Charter that would require this and any future Los Angeles County budgets to earmark 10%, a minimum of 10% of their proposed budget to go towards alternatives to incarceration. Now this includes youth development programs, job training, investments in minority owned businesses, rental assistance, housing vouchers, restorative justice programs, pre-trial treatment and non-custody services, health services, counseling, mental health and substance abuse programs. So basically, as opposed to putting people in jail, this would allocate a minimum of 10% of the county's budget to alternative programs. So basically a yes vote supports amending the county's charter to require no less than 10% of the county's general fund to be appropriated to community programs and alternatives to incarceration, such as the things I just mentioned above. It also authorizes the Board of Supervisors to develop a process to allocate the funds. And this is an important one. It also authorizes the Board of Supervisors to reduce this amount allocated with a vote of four to one during a declared fiscal emergency. And right now we're in an emergency. So under certain circumstances, they could actually reduce that 10% to a smaller amount by a 4-1 vote on the uh, LA County Supervisors. A no vote leaves everything the way it is right now. And it's not that money is not being allocated to those programs it would just guarantee that 10% of the county's general fund budget would be allocated to those programs. So don't think that those are not being funded right now. It just guarantees a certain amount that would be funded. Um, basically the fiscal impact, there's no fiscal impact to us. Uh, it's no new taxes, no new fees. It's money that the county is already getting and um, they're just allocating it a different way. Uh, the supporters of this, it's, it's a pretty small list. Basically, there's four supporters of this initiative, and that's Janice Hahn, Mark Ridley Thomas, Sheila Kuehl, and Hilda Solis. Those were the only four that I could find supporting this. And the opposition is Catherine Barger, Alex Villanueva, our LA County Sheriff, the LA County Deputy Sheriff's Association and the LA County District Attorney's Association are opposing this initiative. So that's relatively simple and it comes down to if bad guys do bad things, if you think they should be in jail, you're not in favor of this. If you think they should get 
programs to try to rehabilitate themselves, re rehabilitate themselves, um, then you might be in favor of this. Uh, that's it. Pretty cut and dry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Um, there was a question, uh, what is the change in allocation from what to 10%? There is no set amount that's allocated right now. It's whatever the, the supervisors decide in their budget. So right now they could be allocating more than 10%. This change would just guarantee that no less than 10% would be allocated, allocated moving forward. Okay. Thank you. So, so I had a quick question. Yeah. Hey, Gary, is there any performance metrics in that that says, hey, look, we've increased the allocation, we've tried alternative programs, and woohoo, it worked? Or, oh, no, that was a bad idea, and let's, sh is there any performance metrics in there like that? Or a time frame? Um, you know what? I didn't see anything like that, but the interesting thing that I found is that I couldn't find anything that shows how much is being allocated to these types of programs now. So uh, again, without knowing what they're spending on it right now, they could currently be spending 10% or more already, but the idea might be this would tie future boards of supervisors hands to not be able to allow to go below that 10% threshold unless a, a state of emergency was declared. Thank you. Yeah, there was a question just, just now, which I think you, you just asked, answered it. You know, as a, what's the current amount um you know for last last year's budget so i think you you just kind of answered that one any other questions on this no okay um okay next up we only have two more <laughs> i'm gonna bring back up dr cliff hamlo he's gonna talk about prop 25. dr hamlo thank thank you joe this one's a little bit tricky because you got to watch what yes and what no means um, because of the way it's uh, been written. In 2009, uh, the California State Senate uh, had Bill 10 that uh, replaced cash bail with assessments for detaining uh, suspects who are awaiting trial. Um, this uh, is going to go into, it has just gone into effect. A yes vote upholds the fact that we're replacing cash bail with risk assessment. A no vote repeals the contested legislation, which is Senate Bill 10, and keeps in place cash bail for detained suspects awaiting trial. Um, the Senate Bill uh, 10 was uh, devised to uh, help lower income folks who could not afford the bails and uh, they would still have to remain in jail where someone with funds could uh, get out. It was designed to make California the first state to end the use of cash bail for all detained suspects awaiting trial. Um, the risk assessments related to um, various categories of low risk, medium risk, high risk, and, um, but there, the no cash out of the pocket created a problem related to people showing up for trial because they're not losing anything. So uh, if, if, we're, if you're in favor of uh, somebody having to put up cash for bail, you would vote no. If you believe that uh, they can be assessed by a judge, they, then you would vote yes. Another aspect of this that's a little bit interesting is that this proposition requires people placed in county jail for most misdemeanors, which are less serious crimes and felonies, to be automatically released within 12 hours of being placed in jail. Certain people placed in jail for misdemeanors, such as uh, domestic violence and so on, 
then they fail to appear in court. And uh, that's happened already uh, under the uh, current proposition or, or uh, uh, current Senate Bill uh, 10. So again, a yes vote says we replace cash bail with the assessment for de de detained suspects awaiting trials. A no vote repeals Senate Bill 10 and says we keep in place the cash bail for detain detained suspects awaiting trial. I think that does it. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Hamill. Anybody have any questions on that one? No? Okay, if, if you do, just hold on a, just a few more minutes. I'm gonna do the last one here, uh, Proposition 24. Now this one's interesting. <laughs> um, this one is called the Consumer Personal Information Law and Agency Initiative. Um, a yes vote on this supports this ballot initiative to expand the state's consumer data privacy laws, including provisions to allow consumers to direct businesses to not share their personal information, remove the time period in which businesses can fix violations before being penalized, and to create a privacy protection agency called the California Privacy Protection Agency to enforce the state's consumer data privacy laws. A no vote opposes this ballot initiative and kind of keeps it as it is. Now, some, some background to this. In um, 2018, the California legislature, it was widely viewed as one of the toughest, you know, for the, or, sorry, let me back up. 2018, the current law that is in place was passed in 2018, went into effect just this past January 1st, and is viewed as one of the toughest consumer privacy laws in the nation. Um, some people say this proposition, which came out and on, on the ballot just a few short months later, is kind of too quick, just to, to, from what I've been reading. Um, people don't really know how well the, the current law is. Um, a lot of the stuff that's in this already is in place where you can tell, you know, businesses not to share your inf information. You've probably seen some of it on websites where you go and there's a button now where this says they have cookies and don't share my information, share my information. You know, this expands that. Um, also, which is one of the troubling part, it eliminates any time period to fix an issue. Now we all know everything's on computer, everything's on phone and such, and there's data breaches. I don't think no matter how tough data security is, it's gonna happen. This would eliminate any time period before fines are you know, done, even if, you know, if it's on accident kind of a thing. And because right, right now businesses have 30 days to fix an issue before they're, um, before they're fined. Right with this, this would eliminate that time period. So if something happens now, immediately they are fined. And some of them are, you know, $2,500 for each violation. The um, $7,500 for each violation involving information of a person under the age of 16. Um, another up to $750 per consumer, per data breach, incident, or actual damages, whichever is greater and so on and so forth. Um, in reading in, into this, um, it does appear that some tech firms um, can use this to create a new kind of a pay for privacy uh, scheme. Um, so in an in, in example, tech companies could downgrade your service for those that cannot or will not pay the extra fee. And where I, how I understand that, and if I'm misreading this, someone let me know. Right now, um, which I know this this part, right, right now everybody enjoys their free email from you know, Google and all that kind of stuff. You don't have to pay to be on Facebook and Instagram, something like that. But from what a lot of people don't, don't know is you are paying 
you're paying with your data. They sell that data to advertisers that are based on criteria to um, share, show you ads, and that's even for free email accounts, um, that based on your activities, and then those companies make money. Because if you think about a lot of these services, how can a company be a billion or a trillion dollar company, but not charge a dime for their service? That's how they do it. With this, they could make it where, okay, if you opt out, they say, oh, well, we have this premium plan because they're gonna get paid somehow or they're going to get paid somehow. And if you don't do that, they could downgrade your service. So maybe it's not as fast or they sh you know, shrink the, your mailbox size or something. You know, there's a lot of different things that could, could happen with, with, with this. So um, now one of the, you know, where this comes into play too, this doesn't affect everybody. This one actually is for the big guys. You know, so like the dry cleaner next door that has a lot of customers, but you know, it's not gonna really affect, affect them. This bill, or this not bill, proposition um, affects businesses of two, $25 million in annual revenue or higher. Um, someone that, uh, companies that buy and sell or share personal information of at least 100,000 consumers a year, or they make more than 50% of its revenue from selling personal information. Because that's the big business right now. Data is king. Data, they say, is more, power, more expensive than precious metals. So this is just kind of expanding and making this um, you know, law that just came into effect in January even tougher and um, more to it. So there's uh, just quickly kind of the supporters of it. Um, Andrew Yang, uh, uh, an organization called Common Sense and Consumer Watchdog. The opponents to it, um, uh, Dolores Herrera, co-founder of United Farm Workers, California Nurses Association, ACLU of California, California Alliance of Retired Americans, um, Council on Islamic American Re Relations, California, ACLU, of Northern California and so on and so forth, the League of Women of Voters of California. So um, this one here is just gonna try to expand something that just started. So and make it, um, but, but, but again, it is for the bigger size companies. So any questions on that one? No? Okay, well, we have come to the end. That's amazing, I mean, I thought we would be here a lot later. <laughs> but um, you know, if, anybody, if, if anybody has any questions, you can unmute yourself. Um, if you want to ask questions, um, uh, or if 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 not, that's fine too. Uh, this is again, this is being was uh, re re recorded, so we will be posting this and sharing it, so you can review it again, share it with people that may may want to learn more from all of our great presenters, which again, thank you to everybody that were a, a presenter today. I uh, really appreciate your, your help with this. And um, you know, we couldn't do it without you. Uh, any questions? Let's see, Ray. No? Everyone's quiet. Everyone's on, on, on mute. Nobody? Okay. <laughs> well, um, okay. Well, if there are any questions, again, I'd like to thank everybody. Um, you know, there, there are some people, our, a lot of our, our city council is online here. You know, we'd like to thank their, for their support of, of this program and the uh, chamber. You know, Mayor Michael Alois, council member Gary Boyer, uh, he was one of our presenters, council member Mendel Thompson. Um, that's who's on here now. Okay. Um, and then, so, so yeah, unless there are any questions. Um, Joe, Joe. Yes, sir. I just want to, just want to thank you for uh, putting it together, leading it. And